Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, today, Mother? You? You What's the secret of the dead come back? Indian Ghost Stories by S. Mukherjee The Bridal Party In Benares, the sacred city of the Hindus, situated in the United Provinces of Agra and Oud, there is a house which is famed pretty far and wide. It is said that the house is haunted, and that no human being can pass a night in that house. Once there was a large bridal party. In India the custom is that the bridegroom goes to the house of the bride with great pomp and show with a number of friends and followers, and the ceremony of Kanyadan, giving away the girl, takes place at the bride's house. The number of people who go with the bridegroom depends largely upon the means of the bride's party, because the guests who come with the groom are to be fed and entertained in right regal style. It is this feeding and entertaining the guests that makes a daughter's marriage so costly in India to a certain extent. If the bride and bridegroom live in the same town or village, then the bridegroom's party goes to the bride's house in the evening. The marriage is performed at night and they all come away the same night or early the next morning. If, however, the places of residence of the bride and the bridegroom are, say, 500 miles apart, as is generally the case, the bridegroom with his party goes a day or two earlier and stays a day or two after the marriage. The bride's people have to find accommodation, food and entertainment for the whole period, which in the case of rich people extends over a week. Now, I had the pleasure of joining such a bridal party as mentioned last, going to Benares. We were about thirty young men besides a number of elderly people. Since the young men could not be merry in the presence of their elders, the bride's father, who was a very rich man, had made arrangements to put up the thirty of us in a separate house. This house was within a few yards of the famed haunted house. We reached Benares at about ten in the morning, and it was about three in the afternoon that we were informed that the celebrated haunted house was close by. Naturally, some of us decided that we should occupy that house rather than the one in which we were. I myself was not very keen on shifting, but a few others were. Our host protested, but we insisted, and so the host had to give way. The house was empty, and the owner was a local gentleman, a resident of Benares. To procure his permission and the key was the work of a few minutes, and we took actual possession of the house at about six in the evening. It was a very large house with big rooms and halls, rather poorly furnished, but some furniture was brought in from the house which we had occupied on our arrival. There was a very big and well-ventilated hall, and in this we decided to sleep. Carpet upon carpet was piled on the floor, and there we decided to sleep on the ground in right oriental style. Lamps were brought and the house was lighted up. At about 9pm our dinner was announced. The oriental dinner is conducted as follows. The guests all sit on the floor and a big plate of metal, say 20 inches in diameter, is placed in front of each guest. Then the service commences and all the plates are filled with dainties. Each guest generally gets thrice as much as he can eat. Then the host, who does not himself join, stands with joined hands and requests the guest to do full justice and the dinner begins. Very little is eaten, in fact, and whatever is left goes to the poor. That is probably the only consolation. Now. On this particular occasion, the bride's father, who was our host, and who was an elderly gentleman, had withdrawn, leaving two of his sons to look after us. He himself, we understood, was looking after his more elderly guests who had been lodged in a different house. The hall in which we sat down to dine was a large one and very well lighted. Adjoining it was the hall in which our beds had been made. The sons of mine host, with a number of others, were serving. I always was rather unconventional. So I asked my fellow guests whether I could fall too, and without waiting for permission, I commenced eating, a very good thing I did, as would appear hereafter. In about twenty minutes, the serving was over, and we were asked to begin. As a matter of fact, I was nearly half through at that time, and then the trouble began. With a click, all the lights went out, and the whole house was in total darkness. Of course, the reader can guess what followed. Who has put out the light, shouted Jagat, who was sitting next but one to me on the left. The ghost, shouted another in reply. I shall kill him if I can catch him, shouted Jagat. The whole place was in darkness. We could not see anything, but we could hear that Jagat was trying to get up. 
Then he received what was a stunning blow on his back. We could hear the thump. Oh, shouted Jagger. Who is that? He sat down again and gave the man to his right a blow like the one he had received. The man on the right protested. Then Jagat turned to the man on his left. The man on Jagat's left evidently resisted, and Jagat had the worst of it. Then Narain, another one of us, shouted out. What's the matter with you? asked his neighbour. Why did you pull my hair? shouted Narain. I did not pull, shouted his neighbour. Then a servant was seen approaching with a lamp, and things became quiet. But the servant didn't reach the hall. He stumbled against something and fell headlong on the ground. The lamp went out, and our trouble began again. One of the party received a slap on the back of his head, which sent his cap rolling, and in his attempt to recover it, he upset a glass of water that was near his right hand. Matters went on in this fashion till a lamp came. The whole thing must have taken about four minutes. When the lamp came, we found that all the dishes were clean. The eatables had mysteriously disappeared. The sons of mine host looked stupidly at us, and we looked stupidly at them and at each other. But there it was. There was not a particle of solid food left. We had therefore no alternative but to adjourn to the nearest confectioner's shop and eat some sweets there. That the night would not pass in peace, we were sure. But nobody dared suggest that we should not pass the night in the haunted house. Once having defied the ghost, we had to stand to our guns for one night at least. It was well after eleven o'clock at night when we came back and went to bed. We went to bed, but not to sleep. The room in which we all slept was a big one, as I have already said, and there were two war lamps in it. We lowered the lamps and, then the lamps went out, and we began to anticipate trouble. Our hosts had all gone home, leaving us to the tender mercies of the ghost. Shortly afterwards we began to feel as if we were lying on a public road, and horses passing along the road within a yard of us. We also imagined we could hear men passing close to us whispering. Sleeping was impossible. We all remained awake, talking about different things, till a horse came very near. And thus the night passed away. At about four in the morning, one of us got up and wanted to go out. We shouted for the servant called Kalu, and within a minute Kalu came with a lantern. One of our fellow guests got up and went out of the room, followed by Kalu. We could hear him going along the dining room hall to the head of the stairs. Then we heard him shriek. We all rushed out. The lighted lantern was there at the head of the stairs and our fellow guest at the bottom, Kalu, had vanished. We rushed down, picked up our friend and carried him upstairs. He said that Kalu had given him a push and that he'd fallen down. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt. We called the servants and they all came, Kalu among them. He denied having come with a lantern or having pushed our friend down the stairs. The other servants corroborated his statement. They assured us that Kalu had never left the room in which they all were. We were satisfied that this was also a ghostly trick. At about seven in the morning, when our hosts came, we were glad to bid goodbye to the haunted house with our bones whole. The funniest thing was that only those of my fellow guests had the worst of it who had denied the existence of ghosts. Those of us who had kept respectfully silent had not been touched. Those who had received a blow or two averred that the blows could not have been given by invisible hands insomuch as the blows were too substantial, but all of us were certain that it was no trick played by a human being. The passing horses and the whispering passers-by had given us a queer, creepy sensation. In this connection may be mentioned a few haunted houses in other parts of India. There are one or two very well-known haunted houses in Calcutta. The Hastings House is one of them. It is situated at Alipur, in the southern suburb of Calcutta. This is a big palatial building now owned by the government of Bengal. At one time it was the private residence of the Governor-General of India, whose name it bears. At present it is used as the State House, in which the Indian chiefs are put up when they come to pay official visits to His Excellency in Calcutta. It appears that in a lane not very far from this house was fought the celebrated duel between Warren Hastings, the first Governor-General of India, and Sir Philip Francis, a member of his council, and the reputed author of the Letters of Junius. When living in this house, Warren Hastings married Baroness Imhoff sometime during the first fortnight of August, about 140 years ago. The event was celebrated by great festivities, and, as expected, the bride came home in a splendid equipage. It's said that this scene is reenacted on the anniversary of the wedding by supernatural agency and a ghostly carriage duly enters the gate 
in the evening once every year. The clatter of hooves and the rattle of iron-tired wheels are distinctly heard, advancing up to the portico. Then there's the sound of the opening and closing of the carriage door. And lastly, the carriage proceeds onwards, but it doesn't come out from under the porch. It vanishes mysteriously. Today, it is the 15th of August, and this famous equipage must have glided in and out to the utter bewilderment of watchful eyes and ears within the last fortnight. There's another well-known ghostly house in Calcutta, in which the only trouble is that its windows in the first-floor bedrooms open at night spontaneously. People have slept at night for a reward in this house, closing the windows with their own hands, and have waked up at night, shivering with cold, to find all the windows open. Once a body of soldiers went to pass a night in this house with a view to solve the mystery. They all sat in a room fully determined not to sleep, but see what happened, and thus went on chatting till it was about midnight. There was a big lamp burning on a table around which they were seated. All of a sudden there was a loud click. The lamp went out, and all the windows opened simultaneously. The next minute the lamp was alight again. The occupants of the room looked at their watches. It was about 1 a.m. The next night they sat up again, and one of them with a revolver. At about one in the morning, this particular individual pointed his revolver at one of the windows. As soon as the lamp went out, this man pulled the trigger five times, and there were five reports. The windows, however, opened, and the lamp was alight again, as on the previous night. They all rushed to the window to see if any damage had been done by the bullets. The five bullets were found in the room, but from their appearance it seemed as if they'd struck nothing. Evidently the bullets would have been changed in shape if they had impinged upon any hard substance. But then, this was another enigma, how did the bullets come back? No man could have put the bullets there from before, for they were still hot when discovered, or could have guessed the bore of the revolver that was going to be used. On the third night, to make assurance doubly sure, these soldiers were again present in the room, but on this occasion they had loaded the revolver with marked bullets. As it neared one o'clock, one of them pointed the revolver at the window. He had decided to pull the trigger as soon as the lamp would go out, but he could not. As soon as the lamp went out, this soldier received a sharp cut on his wrist with a cane, and the revolver fell clattering on the floor. The invisible hand had left its mark behind which his companions saw after the lamp was alight again. Many people have subsequently tried to solve this mystery, but never succeeded. The house remained untenanted for a long time, and finally it was rented by an Australian horse dealer, who, however, did not venture to occupy the building itself, and contented himself with erecting his stables and offices in the compound, where he is not molested by the unearthly visitors. There is another ghostly house, and it's in the United Provinces. The name of the town has been intentionally omitted. Various people saw numerous things in that house, but a correct report never came. Once, a friend of mine passed the night in that house. He told me what he'd seen. Most wonderful, and I have no reason to disbelieve him. I went to pass a night in that house, and I had only a comfortable chair, a small table, and a few magazines besides a loaded revolver. I had taken care to load that revolver myself so there might be no trick, and I had given everybody to understand that. I began well. The night was cool and pleasant, the lamp bright, the chair comfortable, in the magazine which I took up, interesting. But about midnight, I began to feel rather uneasy. At one in the morning, I should probably have left the place if I hadn't been afraid of friends whose servants I knew were watching the house and its front door. At half past one, I heard a peculiar sigh of pain in the next room. This is rather interesting, I thought. To face something tangible is comparatively easy. To wait for the unknown is much more difficult. I took out the revolver from my pocket and examined it. It looked quite all right, this small piece of metal which could have killed six men in half a minute. Then I waited. For what? Well, a couple of minutes of suspense and the sigh was repeated. I went to the door dividing the two rooms and pushed it open. A long, thick ray of light at once penetrated the darkness and I walked into the other room. It was only partial light, but after a minute I could see all the corners. There was nothing in that room. I waited for a minute or two. Then I heard the sigh in the room which I had left. I came back, stopped, rubbed my eyes, 
sitting in the chair which I vacated not two minutes ago was a young girl, calm, fair, beautiful, with that painful expression on her face which could be more easily imagined than described. I had heard of her. So many others who had come to pass a night in that house had seen her and described her, and I had disbelieved. Well, there she sat, calm, sad, beautiful, in my chair. If I had come in five minutes later, I might have found her reading the magazine which I had left open face downwards. When I was well within the room, she stood up facing me, and I stopped. The revolver fell from my hand. She smiled, a sad, sweet smile. How beautiful she was. Then she spoke, a modern ghost speaking like Hamlet's father. Just think of that. You'll probably wonder why I'm here. I shall tell you. I was murdered by my own father. I was a young widow living in this house which belonged to my father. I became unchaste, and to save his own name he poisoned me when I was living on scent. Another week and I should have become a mother, but he poisoned me, and my innocent child died too. It would have been such a beautiful baby, and you would probably want to kiss it. And horror of horrors, she took out the child from her womb and showed it to me. She began to move in my direction with the child in her arms, saying, You would like to kiss it. I don't know whether I shouted, but I fainted. When I recovered consciousness, it was broad daylight, and I was lying on the floor with the revolver by my side. I picked it up and slowly walked out of the house with as much dignity as I could command. At the door I met one of my friends to whom I told a lie that I'd seen nothing. It is the first time that I've told you what I saw in that place. The ghostly woman spoke the language of the part of the country in which the ghostly house is situate. The friend who told me this story is a responsible government official and will not make a wrong statement. What has been written above has been confirmed by others who had passed nights in that ghostly house, but they had generally shouted for help and fainted at the sight of the ghost, and so they hadn't heard her story from her lips as reproduced here. The house still exists, but it's now a dilapidated old affair, and the roof and the doors and the windows are so bad that people don't care to go and pass a night there. There's also a haunted house in Assam. In this house a certain gentleman committed suicide by cutting his own throat with a razor. You often see him sitting on a cot in the veranda, heaving deep sighs. Mention of this house has been made in a book called Tales from the Tigerland, published in England. The author says he has passed the night in the house in question and testifies to the accuracy of all the rumours that are current. Talking about haunted houses reminds me of a haunted tank. I was visiting a friend of mine in the interior of Bengal during our annual summer holidays when I was yet a student. This friend of mine was a son of a rich man and in the village he had a large ancestral house where his people usually resided. It was the first week of June when I reached my friend's house. I was informed that among other things of interest, which were, however, very few in that particular part of the country, there was a large pukka tank belonging to my friend's people which was haunted. What kind of ghost lived in the tank or near it, nobody could say. But what everybody knew was this, that on Jaista Shukla Ekadashi, that is, on the eleventh day after the new moon of the month of Jaista, that occurs about the middle of June, the ghost comes to bathe in the tank at about midnight. Of course, Jaista Shukla Ekadashi was only three days off, and I decided to prolong my stay at my friend's house so that I too might have a look at the ghost's bath. On the eventful day, I resolved to pass the night with my friend and two other intrepid souls near the tank. After a rather late dinner, we started with a bedding and a hooker and a pack of cards and a big lamp. We made the bed, a mattress and a sheet, on a platform on the bank. There were six steps with rises about nine inches each, leading from the platform to the water. Thus, we were about four and a half feet from the water level, and from this coin of vantage we could command a full view of the tank which covered an area of about four acres. Then we began our game of cards. There was a servant with us who was preparing our hooker. At midnight, we felt we could play no longer. The strain was too great, the interest too intense. We sat smoking and chatting and asked the servant to remove the lamp as a lot of insects were coming near, attracted by the light. And, as a matter of fact, we didn't require any light because there was a brilliant moon. At one o'clock in the morning, there was a noise as a rushing wind. We looked round and found that not a leaf was moving, but still the whizzing noise as of a strong wind continued. Then we found something advancing towards the tank from the opposite bank. There was a number of coconut trees on the bank on the other side, and in the moonlight 
we couldn't see clearly what it really was. It looked like a huge white elephant. It approached the tank at a rapid pace, say the pace of a fast-trotting horse. From the bank it took a long leap and with a tremendous splash fell into the water. The plunge made the water rise on our side and it rose as high as four and a half feet because we got wet through and through. The mattress and the sheet and all our clothes were wet. In the confusion, we forgot to keep our eyes on the ghost or white elephant or whatever it was, and when we again looked in that direction, everything was quiet. The apparition had vanished. The most wonderful thing was the rise in the water level. For the water to rise four and a half feet would have been impossible under ordinary circumstances, even if a thousand elephants had gone into the water. We were all wide awake. We went home immediately because we required a change of clothes. The old man, my friend's father, was waiting for us. Well, you're all wet, he said. Yes, said we. Rightly served, said the old man. He did not ask what had happened. We were told subsequently that he got wet like us a number of times when he was a youngster himself. Footnote. Since the publication of the first edition, Hastings House has been converted into an Indian rugby for the benefit of the cadets of the rich families in Bengal. Well, that was The Bridal Party by S. Mukherjee. S. Mukherjee, whose name appears in various transliterations, including S. Mukherjee, uh, with a K-H and a J-E-E, published his book of Indian ghost stories in 1917. To my great disappointment, I can find no biographical information on him, or even what his first name was, or even if he was a man, but I think he was a man from the stories. I wondered if he were related to the Mukherjee family who pioneered Indian cinema in the early 20th century, but I have no evidence that he is. At the time of writing the first edition, he lived in Calcutta, Kolkata, and his stories show his familiarity in residence in Bengal, but he later lived in the second edition preface. He was living in Allahabad, which is Prayagraj in Uttar Pradesh. The name Mukherjee is a Kulin Brahmin name and common in West Bengal. He clearly moved in high circles because in the introduction he notes that his friends are judges and lawyers and he says that his father had a coachman when he was growing up and he had a nurse. So he was clearly wealthy and he was Indian, but it was the time of the British Raj and I'm guessing that his education would have reflected the uh, Britishification, if that hideous word exists, um, of India at that time. I picked an Indian story because there are lots of Indian listeners to the podcast. The ghost story form, of course, was very prevalent in the late Victorian and Edwardian periods, and we've seen there are Australian ghost stories, Scottish ghost stories, Irish ghost stories. I'm guessing there probably would be South African ghost stories as well, New Zealand ghost stories, but it was um, a form that was prevalent in the English-speaking world or where Anglo culture prevailed or was felt You'll notice also that it isn't actually a piece of fiction. I've excused myself because I wanted to do an Indian story, but also Mukherjee actually presents the stories as if they were fiction. He doesn't uh, give a, a, a reported... I mean, it is supposed to be a first-person true report, but in that it's not much different from a fictional account because he gives the characters voices, they speak, they have some characterization. So it's not just it's not just the he did, she did. It's not like a newspaper report. It is more like a story. But that is um, my excuse. I say about these true first-person accounts because there is a whole genre of podcasts and material, ghost story material, which is about people's apparently true experiences. I, years ago, ran a website called Haunted Britain and Ireland, which was the whole purpose of the website was to list places that had ghost stories where you could go and stay. And I collected, um, I did a book, actually, a, a collection of people's first person sort of supernatural experiences. Um, but there are lots of podcasts, if that's your thing, you can go and listen to that. I've moved on from that. I actually prefer the fictional stories now because what I found was a lot of the supposedly true stories, and they may have been true, a pointless, you know, there, there's no drama to them, there's no conflict, there's no moral tale, there's no nothing, they just, uh, I went down past this graveyard and I saw this mist and I ran away and that was that. So I prefer a properly crafted story. But this was because I wanted to do something Indian and 
it was the closest thing I could get, basically. So there we are. I haven't got much rambling this week. It's a pretty short one. The podcast numbers seem to be falling, but I guess that could be two reasons. One of them is that we're coming into high summer, in the Northern Hemisphere at least, so people are going out more, and people are going out more because lockdowns are starting to ease in different places across the Northern Hemisphere. So people probably are doing other things rather than listening to podcasts. That leads me to say neatly, if you do know somebody who would like it, then share it with them and get them listening. That would be cool. And that brings us to the end of this short episode. So next week, I'm thinking of doing Oscar Cook's Boomerang, which was recommended by a listener. So that's great. Keep your recommendations coming in. It, it's great to have a two-way process. I really enjoy it. I can do, then do more of what you like. It's time for the call to action. You know, every week I like to do a call to action and I like to mix it up a bit. So this week, I'd just like to ask you if you know anybody who might like this podcast, just to recommend them, share it, send a link. We're active on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. So if you if you were on those accounts and you come across us, if you just share it, that would be really cool and just get more people listening. There's so many great stories. I mean, we're, we're past 50 episodes now. And there's still so many stories I want to do. So there's still life in the old dog. So any shares and recommendations would be very welcome. Spread it far and wide. Okay, hope you're all well. I'll speak to you next week.